Welcome to the um, March editions of Reflections. It, uh, springtime's always beautiful here on our campus. I would remind, uh, if you haven't had a chance, look at the blossoms in the fish pond courtyard. They are just outstanding. And we're supposed to get a heavy rain tonight and tomorrow. So if you want to get a look at them or get your picture of the beautiful Brandon Oaks campus, this is the time to do it. It's uh, uh, appreciate y'all coming. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, uh, John Reinhardt. And I know, you know, we've you've seen the little posters up, the Mountaineer character, uh, being a West Virginia guy. I was, uh, it was difficult, Teresa and I wrestled with kind of how to title this thing because uh, a mountaineer implies uh, West Virginia University and he is a hokey to all the way to the bottom of his feet. But yeah, John was uh, raised and in fact, he, uh, Joette here? Well, she's on the way. But John and Joette were raised over in uh, West Virginia. Mullins, is that right? Mullins. Now, if you have to have to really go looking for it if you want to find it. But um, then they were raised in high school together, went their separate ways, had their families. Uh, John went to Virginia Tech, and he got his degree in uh, electrical engineering. He got his master's degree in electrical engineering and then went on to have a successful uh, electrical contracting business in West Virginia. He also, for many, many years, uh, was a pastor and served uh, many churches and in and around, and I'm not sure, but that may well be where he learned all the stories and he learned all of the uh, the comebacks and what have you that he knows. John's a character, and we're pleased to have him with us today. John's not a very graceful character anymore, but uh, everybody wants to help me, and they say, could I help you? And I say, no, all I need is patience. So just be patient while I'm there. Well, they asked me what the title to my sp talk would be, and I never did get around to telling them. Then all of a sudden, this shows up on the Katie every morning, and <laughs> I thought, well, uh, it's been a few years ago. My granddaughter was in a musical down in Winston Salem, and I went to went to watch her, of course. And uh, one of her classmates came up to me after the, after the show was over. And she said, uh, "I I really want to meet you." I said I heard you were a character. <laughs> so I guess the word is out. So I might as well own up to it. And. Uh, I want to be a good character, not a bad one. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some things about what it was like to grow up in, uh, in, in the mountains and my uh, ancestors and so forth. But uh, I'm going to it'll be a little bit of a contrast. I've been kidding Molly Coon about I was going to say what the other side because she was part of the, I called her the landed gentry because they had the, the King of England, I guess, gave her family property and stuff. And uh, my grandfather Reinhardt never owned a piece of property in his life. The other two grandparents inherited a little 20-acre plot, and that was the old. The, they none of them ever owned a car or anything like that. Uh, so that was uh, the main part of it. But they did have one thing in common, very important. Uh, I'm sure Molly will, they, there wasn't a lazy bone in the bunch. They had to work. And I remember my mother, uh, I had asked her when I started to school that she was, uh, 
uh, I was, we were studying history and about what the Great Depression was like. And I asked her, well, Mother, what was the Depression like? And uh, she said, well, she had no recollection. Everything was the same. They lived on a hillside farm. They grew their food. They had cows and chickens and pigs and raised everything they had, and that just went on. The Depression didn't affect them at all. And I'd ask my uncle about, uh, did he, did Grandpa ever feel under the pressure like many of us have that have been in business, We'd had, we had contracts to meet and deadlines and all that sort of thing? He said, no, he never felt any of that. And the, the truth being that what they did was when the spring came and the ground got warm, you, you knew you had to put the crops in the ground. And when they got up, you worked them and you just did what, was, what came handy. And uh, so there wasn't any such thing as being lazy. So I'm going to show you some pictures here of some people that uh, uh, just from a long time ago. Uh, this, was, this was my grandparents' Uh, my grandparents, my grandmother McKinney, that's her parents and a bunch of their relatives. I guess that's most of them, but that's a lot of people, along with, uh, with the in-laws and outlaws. Uh, let's see if I can point here. This girl here was my mother, and my grandparents are right along in here. And uh, that's a bunch of my cousins. Uh, I, I, a, a lot of those people I knew. I know this, this fellow here was a, uh, was a New York banker. I, I guess he was very successful. After he retired from banking, he came and taught at, w, I mean at UVA, where he went to college. And this is another uh, picture on the same plot. That's the immediate family of them. This is my grandmother right here. Of course, these are the old folks. Does, uh, does anybody recognize that man? He's known by some people here. Anybody recognize that? Who? Yeah. Uh, that's Dora's dad, who is, my who is my grandmother's youngest brother. And we didn't know that until we moved here, until I moved here and we got to talking. Isn't that the, so? So I'm glad to can't claim her as my cousin. She's a very sweet lady, and uh, I think a lot of her now that we've got acquainted. Now you notice that fence. There wasn't much manufactured product in that. There was plenty of logs around, and that's the way they made their fences. And I watched a little bit of that built. There's a lot of labor in that. Let me tell you. This is mother's immediate family. Uh, of course, this is my grandparents. She didn't like to talk about it much, but they were first cousins. Um, they, uh, uh, that's kind of unusual, but uh, I guess the gene pool wasn't very big back in that day. And, uh, 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 but all of their children grew up to be uh, just fine. Uh, this was, this was mother, and they had nine boys and, and two girls. That's her sister. Uh, it's a, a ni nice group of people. Of course, I was good friends with all of those folks. And this is they, here they are in later years. Uh, see, see, Grandma and Grandpa, have got, they, were, they were quite old then. They... Uh, a little story, uh, like Polly. I'm not. I'm not being politicking, but I'm. I'll tell you a little of our history. None of us were ever involved in politics, except this fellow here ran for assessor two different times. That was my uncle Dewey. He was the youngest, and uh, one time he got 49 percent of the vote. At that time, there were in Southern West Virginia, there wasn't one Republican ever elected to anything. And he was a Republican, and he got 49% of the vote one time, and we called him the county Republican. <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting story later on when uh, Arch Moore got elected as governor, who was a Republican later, later years, appointed him as the commissioner of the roads for the county. 
and uh, which took care of the maintenance and keeping things repa uh, repaired. Well, after Arch went out of office, uh, there was a, a, a fellow named Gaston Caperton was uh, elected as governor. He was a Democrat and came from our part of the country. And uh, he knew that he was going to get fired or get replaced. And so he was, uh, he said one day these guys in suits came into his office and called, wanted to call him into the office and talk to him. And he said, uh, he, they, he knew they came to fire him. And he said, well, Caperton's been, he's been asking around and said, you've got a real good reputation and said, he'd like you to stay. And uh, I mean, that was real flattering for come from, from a Republican family, but he was 74 at the time, so he, he told him he would just go ahead and retire. And, uh, and of, uh, of course, uh, one of the Democrat politicians in town told me the story. He told me this himself, so I know it was truth. He said that uh, Grandpa was talking to him and was telling, bragging about his sons, about what all they did. Uh, see, three of them were barbers. Uh, this one and that one and this one. And some worked on the railroad and did different things. And he was bragging about, you know, how well they'd all done. And he says, and you know, Edward's a Democrat. <laughs> 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 the Democrat politician thought that was really funny. And uh, but I, I still think it's funny. But uh, he was a good guy, Grandpa was. He was honest as the day was long. And he would never buy or sell anything on Sunday. I've been to his house when some fellows came and wanted to, he traded in, uh, in dried skins and so forth, and these boys came to sell them to him. And it was on Sunday, and he said, no, he said, uh, come back tomorrow and I'll buy them, but I won't do them today. So this is my mother. And this is the house they grew up in. Uh, that was there was two there was this was one room cabin here that they built when they got married and they moved into it. It had one room on the bottom and a and a loft in the top. And later they built a little kitchen on the side of it. But that those that's a log cabin. It had boards put on it in later years. Uh, it's a log cabin, mostly cedar logs. And uh, one of the distant cousins of mine tore it down and rebuilt it somewhere else and then with those nine boys they they had to have more room uh, I guess before they all left home so they they built another one room cabin here and uh, when we would come and spend the night there when I was a boy well, that's the room that we would sleep in uh, this is mother's brother Ralph uh, he was uh, he, he was an honest guy he was really uh, he, he was eccentric that he, uh, he didn't make it when he got drafted in the army. He didn't. Uh, he didn't make it through basic. I don't know exactly the whole story was, but he said uh, his description of it said, you know, you could just be walking through the woods and everything would be peace and quiet, and said all of a sudden somebody would holler double time. He said I just didn't see any sense in that at all. <laughs> <laughs> So you fellas been in the army could probably probably can relate to that, but he was really clever. He could build mechanical things, and he put his own radio together back before you could buy radios much. And uh, uh, I was really impressed by him. Uh, later on, after my grandparents died, and I was working for the coal mines, I would uh, I, he had that one room cabin. I would haul coal for him to keep him warm. So he could have, uh, he still had a cold stove there. And on the left side of this porch, you can see the, I don't know if you can still see it, but those are guttering there. They caught their, caught their water off of, the, off of these uh, tin roof that went into barrels that were down here. They used that, that to wash. And about 100 yards down a real steep bank to the left was a, was a spring. So to get water, every bit of drinking water had to be carried up that bank. It was, that was quite a chore when, uh, I understand that if somebody misbehaved, they told them to go carry water. That would uh, take care of the energy. This is Uncle Ralph and two of my sisters. That's Lula on the left and Sheila on the right. That's closer up of the house. 
and this is Grandpa sitting on that swing. Uh, of course, he enjoyed sitting there. As he's getting pretty old at that time. But when he, Uncle Ralph had built this, he built a, he put a radio together himself, and it would work. And he ran a long antenna out, out the, around the hill into the top of a big tree out there. And Grandpa was sitting in that swing. Lightning struck that antenna and threw him out in the yard. <laughs> But, uh, but he survived. Uh, this is my other grandparents. Uh, that's, uh, his name is Erastus Hiram Reinhardt, and her maiden name is Amanda Renee Whit. He died when he was 81, and so he, that must have not have been too long before he died. He was a, he was a carpenter, and he had, he had built a bunch of the houses in Keystone, West Virginia, uh, in uh, later years, uh, or I don't know how much later, but he was a preacher in the Old Agar Baptist Church for a long time. That was the same group that I was. And when he started, uh, these were the churches that were, you probably all heard of the circuit rider churches, where they met one, one Sunday a month, and the preacher would come, and he rode a horse to those churches. He rode a horse and spent the night, uh, and they preached on Saturday night and Sunday morning. So he'd preach on Saturday night and Sunday morning, and he'd stay with somebody, a member of the church. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then he'd go back on Sunday afternoon. And he lived in, a, in the house that I was born in, which in, I think this was his garden there, which would have been a few yards away. And that was a slab shanty up, up on Cedar Creek with no running water or electricity. And the... Uh, the first thing I remember about him or significant about him was that I remember him being in, in his living room talking to, talking to my daddy. And he had been a pastor for a long time, and he was quite a scholar of the Old Testament. And, uh, and I can remember the year because now I know history. It was in 1948. And I remember him telling daddy how that the... Uh, the, the Jewish people had been coming back to the land in what we know now as Israel. They'd been coming back for a number of years, and, uh, uh, and, and he recited the story about how, and if you read in, uh, in Genesis that, about the covenant that God made with Abraham, that, they were, that his seed would be God's chosen people and his seed would be a blessing to the whole world. Of course, he was pointing to Christ by doing that. And, uh, but he told him that he would scatter his seeds to the four winds of the earth and he would bring them back to the land and they would be a nation again. Well, that was 1948. And they came, and that's when they became recognized as a nation again, came back to the same land that they left, spoke the same language and there was the same customs and everything, and, and they were a nation again. And uh, Harry Truman was a Democrat, of course, and... and uh, uh, that's not any joke about that at all, uh, but but I remember my dad saying that uh, uh, that we may history may point him as being a better president than we might have thought he was, but Harry was the one that he he individually recognized those people from the government, this new government in Israel, and uh, he recognized them and that put them over the hump to be a nation again, and that's that's where we are. So that's part of my part of my background, and I'll never forget that, that story. And I told that story when I preached in Jerusalem Baptist Church. This is Grandma's family. You can, uh, this is her right here. There was 11 in that family, and they were all, you can see they were all still alive when this one, I think she was close to 60 years old. That's hard to imagine. They, uh, uh, for the most part, they love the Lord. They, and this is uh, this fellow here is Joe. That's Uncle Joe. That's uh, Joette's uh, first husband's grandfather. Uh, and of course, he was a, he was a sweet guy. And I really thought a lot of him. This one over here was uh, that was Uncle Johnny. I guess in a way, I was named after him after my dad was named after him. Uh, Uncle Johnny was the one, he was a preacher in later years, but he told me in early years he spent time in prison for making liquor, but of course he, he turned his life around. 
and uh, this was Aunt Emma Zella here, and uh, this is a little story. I don't, you, you know, I don't usually talk like this, but I, they were putting, uh, they were putting water in the house. They, they lived up a hollow in, in the other part of the county, and they were putting water in the house, and uh, uh, his, his name was Henry Milam, and his grandson told me about this, said that they were putting water in there and going to put a toilet in it. And his remark was, who ever heard of shitting in the house? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, it's never been done before, so. <laughs> and that's me. And that porch without a banister wouldn't make meet code today, would it? Oh, you notice that uh, that dress. I have a picture, and I wasn't able to get it to put on this, of, of my grandfather, the older fellow, that when he was about that age, when he was in his parents' uh, lap, and he had a dress about the same. So I guess that's, they do it, dressed all children with dresses until they got to up to a certain point. And that's the baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. You remember that song? Yeah. Well, they baptized John J. Reinhardt in Cedar Creek that day. That's my dad on the left. And that's, uh, that was the change that uh, uh, might tear up a little bit. That was the, uh, that was the change of my life. Uh, I know that I had plans when I was a boy, and I like to talk to uh, 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 Ralph Beadle and uh, uh, some of these other fellows that were in the military. I like to talk to you because I can kind of, uh, by proxy, live what I had planned for my life, that I wanted to grow up and be in the military and do all these go places and do all these wonderful things. Well, that was my plan. That wasn't God's plan. But uh, when I made a profession of faith, that was when uh, I had been to church a lot and I, I knew the gospel and I knew that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's, that's the main message. So, but I, got, I broke my right hip. I, over, a, over a matter of a little over a year, I, the, you doctors, I had bilateral slip to pipses. That meant the ball slipped off of the, the femur on both sides. And they pinned them back, and then arthritis set in, and I later became very crippled. So I, my, that was no military career. And so I knew then that I had to study, and, but I made that profession of faith in the hospital bed. Sometimes the Lord has to put you flat on your back to get your attention, you know. And anyhow, he got my attention, so then I knew I would have to have to do something else. But I remember when I was a boy, and I'd heard the gospel, and I, I'd lay awake at night, and I'd think, boy, oh, you know, if you don't wake up in the morning, you're going to be in hell for eternity and apart from God. But once I made that profession of faith and, and accepted the Lord, you know, I've never had that thought again. Sometimes I'd lay awake and worry about it, but I've never worried about it a minute since. That, that that was the gift he gave me, that peace that passeth understanding. So uh, anyhow, that was my baptism. And this is my dad. Uh, we'd been married about a year, and that's the view from a place called Grandview uh, from Turkey Spur. Uh, and that's him baptizing some other people. He was a foreman of a line crew, but he pastored these churches, and he did similar to the way I did. Uh, but about a year before he died, he, uh, he, he told me that, uh, or as a part before that, he, had, uh, he, he was a very effective evangelist in almost every church in the county and other counties that invited him to, to preach revivals for him. You know, that's where they would invite a, get, a guest speaker in, and they'd preach every night for a week. And... Uh, and, and a lot of people were accepted the Lord during that time. But this was the crew that he, 
he was the foreman of that crew that built power lines. They built them through the mountains and stuff. Sometimes I'd go with him, but uh, it looked like a pretty rough bunch. But uh, this was Dad here. This boy ran a bulldozer in the Philippines, and he fought in the war. This one, uh, that's, that, th this fellow married my first cousin. This was Dad's first cousin. His name is Harrison Goad, and he lied about his age to join, and he fought in World War II. He lied about his age to join, and so he, he fought there. And then uh, he later went to Korea, and he was wounded in Korea, and then he was still in the Army when he went to Vietnam. So he got, he got a whole bunch of... Uh, this boy here, is, his name is Archie McKinney. He's my first cousin. And a little a story by, by him, after we put our DNA on uh, Ancestry.com, I got a message on there from somebody. There's a girl, woman named Harriet Gutshaw. Said I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk to you. We might be related. And uh, so I sent her my phone number, and she called. And Joe Edward was on the way back from Leesburg one day, and the phone rang, and we talked a little bit. And she said, "Did you have any relatives in Nome, Alaska, in 1953?" <laughs> and he was, I'm sorry, he. He was stationed in Nome at, uh, in 1953. So he and, a Mexi he and an Eskimo girl uh, got together, and he, he later married a different Eskimo uh, and had, <laughs> had, had four children by her. So she didn't know who she was. She wanted to know who she was. So, he, uh, and so I was able to tell her that, of course, he was already dead by then, and, and his brother was also dead. And... Uh, but he did have four children by a different Eskimo woman, and I put her in touch with them, and she was excited to find out, uh, find out who her family was. And so that was, uh, you put your, you, I thought it was a lot of fun to go on this ancestry thing, and it is fun because things like that turn up, and uh, and you, all you have to do is just laugh about it. I remember one of my. Uh, one of my grandmother's first cousins was talking to me. I was asking him questions and taking notes about our ancestors, and the names didn't line up about this fellow had a son that had a different name. I said, well, how'd that happen? He said, haphazard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's about But anyhow, that, this girl's mother, she said she had eight children by eight different men and was never married to any of them. I mean, that's really flabbergasting to me. No, that's certainly not. And that's me and Sheila and our three daughters early on. I guess any of you recognize what that little house out back might there? <laughs> and this was, uh, that's my brother Ralph and me. We had, uh, we were partners for about 30 years, but over the years I, I first went to work at, uh, company named Guy and Machinery in, uh, in Logan and then moved up to, worked uh, for a year or so up at Hercules and then went over to Inland Motors in Bradford. That's when I got my master's degree while I was working for Inland Motors. And then I felt like I wanted to be have a business of my own, so I, I took a job in Oak, in Oak Hill, West Virginia to with a fellow that I thought I would have an opportunity to do that. It wasn't so, but I later went to work for uh, uh, for Jim Justice, who was the dad of the governor of West Virginia. Now I worked at coal mines for him for several years. Uh, I later I was a certified uh, mine foreman. I've spent many a day underground. Um, he had several mines, and I helped keep the power lines going to him and that sort of thing. I later was just talking to a fellow who had been. Uh, who had been to, uh, he was a retired Army major, and he, he was, uh, he said, uh, I was telling him about being underground, and he said, I'd, I'd rather be in a firefight than go underground. But I've been, been in coal mines that that table wouldn't set up in, 27 inches, uh, so you just crawl around, and that's really hard work. Uh, those fellows earn every penny that they get. And they have these conveyor belts in there that where they put coal on it brings it to the outside. And they have a fella who, each one of them has someone to maintain those to make sure they don't something go wrong on them. 
they crawl 3,000 feet up and 3,000 feet back every every shift and make sure everything stays. They're all they all are skinny as squirrels, but but the coal mine was uh, that was a very interesting thing. Uh, then I went to work for Joy Manufacturing and uh, then I was involved with uh, rebuilding their machinery. And then I got this opportunity to come over and buy into a little contracting company. And th that was in Beckley. And my brother Ralph later came in as a, as a partner. We both had degrees in Virginia Tech. And that was a piece of the equipment that uh, one of them that we made while that went to Saudi Arabia. We did a lot of work for Union Carbide and that was one of the, one of the things that went to Union Carbide. And that's me and Sheila and uh, our daughter Monica over here and her husband Gerald and her two little girls. Anybody recognize that girl? I mean, we, Joette and I had no idea that we would ever be where we are today, but of course Sheila died. Her husband was already dead and she liked to travel, so we invited her to go along on that trip. And as it happened, that was a Bible study cruise where uh, David Jeremiah and uh, Charles Stanley and some of those fellows was on it. We went on and, uh, and of course Monica and her girls, she homeschooled them and uh, so she was able to take us, take them, and go go along on those trips. And uh, on on one of those trips, when we got off of the boat, the last time I ever saw this little girl here, she uh, she died within two weeks, and she looked just like she did there. Uh, to this day, now her daddy is a pathologist, so, but she had she had had she said she had a great day that day, but earlier on, she had asked her mother when we went to her grandmother's funeral, she said, uh, uh, said, Mommy, what would happen to me if you died? Uh, she came, she realized that people wasn't here all the time. Like, we were well aware of that here, but she was seven years old, and uh, she said, oh, don't worry, she said, if something had happened to me, she said, you'll, I'll always be your mommy. And she said, yeah, but when God says you go, you gotta go. And uh, so after one of those trips, the last time I, within two weeks, she was having a good day and she started breathing funny and she just died in her mother's arms. And, and they're not over that yet. And of course she would be a senior in college now. So we always wonder what, what might have been. Uh, I know that everybody here can relate to that, but uh, but anyhow, she, she was already making plans for me to baptize her. So <coughs> we're confident she's with the Lord. And that's getting baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, a, that's the Jordan River down near, down near Jericho. Uh, and that's actually... Uh, across, this is the border. That's that's Jordan over there, and uh, uh, and this side is uh, is Israel. That's my grandson Adam. He's uh, he's since graduated. He was a, he just graduated from high school. So my my graduation gift to my grandchildren was that I would pay for a foreign mission trip, and I would go with them. So I did it. To, for all of them, uh, the last one, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, but uh, but Scott, the oldest one, he came back and told his daddy, he said, I've uh, said that changed my life. So it, it was money, money well spent. And this is, uh, I know you can't tell who that guy is, the name Mike Cobb, but he, he used to play for the Chicago Bears. Uh, and this, we were on a mission trip doing sports clinics for the Palestinian kids for the most part. But this was over, we'd gone over into Jordan, and this is the mountain, Mount Pisgah, where, where Moses was able to look over into, into the promised land. If you remember the story, because of his disobedience, he, was, he wasn't able to go, but the Lord let him look. And uh, if you look, of course, it's hazy, but it was hazy that day. But the ground over there looked just like it does here. It looks like an abandoned strip mine. There's just not much, much green.
because it's desert, but uh, the Jews were able to move in there and, uh, and make a green, lush country of it. But uh, anyhow, uh, Mike was a good friend. We had a good time with him. Now this is, I don't know if you can read all that, but uh, this was a cartoon that I ran across. I kept it on a refrigerator. It says, look at that. Is there anything more beautiful than a baby? That's what she says. And he says, as a matter of fact, there is, yes, you. Me? Sure, babies are beautiful, but they come by that naturally. But beautiful old people are works of art. <laughs> so, uh, so I want you all. You all are proof of that, and uh, so I think that's a, that's a good thought. This little girl's name is Wafa. She is a sweet lady who uh, she was just a child when we started going, but she she was always playing uh, playing basketballs, involved in the different things. Uh, she's a real sweet girl. And this is a Palestinian family that. Uh, their little boy was, he was, they were doing sports clinics, you know, to play basketball, like, because the people that went were coaches and college athletes, so they were doing sports clinics to these, uh, to, to the Palestinian children, so they would, they would, they would teach them basketball, and then when they took a break, they would give them a Bible lesson, and then, uh, and then they'd go back for the next lesson. On the last day, uh, we'd do the same thing, and then give them an opportunity to, uh, uh, to follow Christ, but this fellow was uh, uh, in. He was. Uh, he took a liking to me for some reason, and he actually, when I was there by myself, he invited me to his house. They had a family reunion that weekend, and you know they had a, a big feed, just like all of us would have at a family reunion. And I was the only one there that didn't speak Arabic, and uh, they treated us like family. And this is Joette and me when we were there. You see that girl is on, she has long sleeves and I, I, that might not have been wool, but it was very heavy clothes with a flak jacket and all that stuff on and carrying a, uh, and here we are, it was hot that day. And she didn't have a bead of sweat. I don't know, uh, I don't know how they tolerate that heat, but, uh, but you see these fully armed, anywhere you go, you see uh, they're there to take care of business. And look at this. This is the Greenbrier when the, on our wedding night. Uh, it, that's, that's a far cry. When I got married the first time, we, I think it was 5 or $6 a night in a little motel up in Ripley, West Virginia, where she, <laughs> she, she, she I, I allow. I guarantee you this is more than. But anyhow, I told them we were getting married, and so they did the heart. And those were live, live rose petals, so that was real romantic. And anybody recognize anybody there? This is Joette. She was on the homecoming court, and uh, that was the homecoming queen. And uh, oh, that was a long time ago. She was a, she was cutie back then. And this is the of of all this family that on the McKinneys, there were several of them went to college. But of the Reinhardts, this girl was the first one that went, she went away to nurses training. And uh, she came down here to Lewis Gale and took nurses training at, uh, at Lewis Gale. And we were, uh, we were real proud of her and because nobody else in that whole, of that whole generation of my grandfather Reinhardts had ever gone away to study. This is her later on. Anybody recognize this girl? Somebody here knows who they are. That's Sylvia Eccles. <laughs> she, she gave me that picture. <laughs> but she was giving me pictures of my cousin that I didn't have. And, but they were, they, were, uh, they were in nurses training together. And this is Joette and, uh, and us. We were on the Mount of Olives here looking over. You see the, the Dome of the Rock over there in Jerusalem. This is another Palestinian family that uh, that they became good friends. When I took my grandchildren over, uh, 
Uh, of course, my grandchildren call me Grandpa, and all the other ch other kids call me Grandpa too. And so I could call this girl. I've called her many times on the phone uh, after I've been over here, and she'll say hi, Grandpa. But uh, they're beautiful family, and uh, uh, her the dad took me out. He was quite a clever guy about making things he could weld and so forth. He took me back on the back of his house to show me the porch he had built and some crafts that he had done. And he said, you see those nicks in the rocks up there? You know, all the buildings over there are made out of uh, that limestone. See those nicks up? I said, yeah. He said, well, one day the soldiers were over here and there's some others over there that were shooting at each other and said the bullets came down here and come through the, come through the windows and set the curtains on fire and they were in the house while that was going on and they crawled down to a lower level to, to be safe, but that's what they live with all the time. And uh, a beautiful family and we really loved them. They, they treated us really good. They fed, fed us several times. And that's, uh, that's Jim Green and Joette with their family. You know, Jim was my, he was my second cousin. We, we, we graduated from high school together Grew up about a quarter of a mile apart. We played many a, many a day. And then that's here. That's, that's the end of my story. So that was a, that was a last tie, that was the last tie outing that we had away from here. <laughs> and uh, all I can say to you is I'm, I'm so grateful to everybody here who's been so nice to me and so gracious uh, and uh, have treated me like uh, like one of you, even though I am a poor hillbilly from the mountains. <laughs> Any questions for John? Well, I had, yes, uh, there is, they are doing okay. Uh, right after the war started, I, I have some friends in Bethlehem. At, uh, in fact, when Joette and I, that picture when we were there on the Mount of Olives, actually we were dating then. We had gone over to uh, uh, this Palestinian boy was was getting married, and he said their, his family owned a, owned a hotel, said you can stay for free in the hotel if you'll come to the wedding. Well. We took him up on that, so uh, so I called him, and he's doing fine. Uh, they, they in Bethlehem, they're away from the fighting. Of course, the fighting's in Gaza, and then I don't have a picture of him. But there's a, a Jewish boy that uh, I got acquainted with on the first trip over there, uh, and he and I have kept in touch ever since. In fact, he's come and visit us in West Virginia. Uh, and I called him, and he he said all of his family is in is okay. So uh, uh, I think it's just a it's 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 confined mostly to Gaza, the ones that's really in trouble. But but the ones uh, uh, with the ones that are shooting those rockets over from north into into Israel, it's hard to tell where they go. I know the, the Jewish fellow that, uh, that's my friend, he said one of their close friends uh, got, uh, they, she got killed by, a, by one of the suicide bombers. And uh, uh, that, of course, that, that doesn't go on now, but it's that sort of thing uh, that uh, that's kind of makes you really sad. And another fellow that, uh, uh, that lived there, I was talking to him, he said they had to, they had to let, if they let their children go out and play, they had to play in a walled area because that that people would just shoot at kids just for no reason at all, and uh, so they had to keep keep real close watch on them. Can I ask one more question? Sure. The person that was the, the relative that was a nurse, did she happen to have gone to Berea College before she was pregnant? No, she went to Lewis Gale to nurse. To nurse. To be a nurse, and then she went. To well, you know, I've got a friend that went to Berea, though. Uh, uh, in fact, he turned out to be an orthopedist. He was my good buddy that uh, 
uh, when I had my hips replaced the first time, he was a resident at, uh, at Mayo Clinic, and we went out there, and I, Sheila stayed with him for a month. Back then, if you had your hip replaced, you stayed in the hospital for two weeks, and then if you had the other one done, you stayed another two weeks. So I stayed a month in the hospital having two hips replaced. But that was 50 years ago. Yeah. Jo yeah, Johnny House, yeah. <laughs> and that was before the days of toilet paper, and he always kept it, you know, you got the Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> either, either that or corn cobs. And, 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 and the Sears catalog, you tore a page off of it, and you had to crumple it, you know, to, <laughs> to, to make it kind of, to keep it from being so slick. <laughs> Okay, John, thank you so much. We are glad you and Joette are here.